Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh lecture in our Lawrence Technological College of Architecture and Design virtual lecture series. My name is Peter Davis, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker today on behalf of the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee. <clears throat> but first, a bit about our college. The College of Architecture and Design offers degrees in architecture, game design, graphic design, industrial design, interior design, and transportation design. It is dedicated to a pedagogy of theory and practice, the original model of Lawrence Technological University, advocating not one or the other, but both integrated and coherent. We're joined by David Myers this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce him. We often look for people like David outside the college to come and share our, his, their inspirational thoughts and vision. David grew up <clears throat> in Minneapolis and has lived in Germany, Japan, California, and also Western Michigan before settling in Milwaukee. He has studied engineering and philosophy at RPI and has a Bachelor of Science degree in industrial design from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. David is very busy as a mobility consultant. He co-founded a startup called Streetscope and leads a nonprofit organization called Operation Wheels of Freedom Foundation to honor and entertain US service members with cars while teaching safe and responsible driving to address a serious rise in vehicle accidents among returning veterans. Kind of like a USO on wheels. So David is a car-minded guy, but he looks beyond just designing vehicles. He looks to the future and how people and things need to move around the planet in more desirable and environmentally friendly ways. We're talking five, 10, 20, 50 years from now. So automotive design is, a tremendous, is in a tremendous transition period and David speaks to the creative mind and the designer's role in that transition. I might note that David was invited to testify before Congress in 2008 in Senator Ed Markey's energy independence and global warming hearing about whether the government should bail out the US auto industry during the unfolding economic crisis. It is my pleasure to introduce David Myers. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, uh, Lawrence Tech, for inviting me to share some thoughts on the future of, of the automotive industry, the future of mobility, the, the future of how people um, move around. So thank you very much for doing this. And, and thanks for uh, hosting events like this because it's great to bring people together and talk about change and, and, and better understand and better prepare for how it's all going to unfold. So thanks again for the opportunity. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about um, future mobility, change, um, and, and the designer's role in, in, in all of that. Um, I'm a car designer by, by trade. Um, but I'm very interested not just on kind of next year's cars, but the future of how we all move around. And I have some thoughts about all of that. And I'm, I'm going to share hopefully some thoughts that are beneficial to people in the audience about how you look at change and, and what you offer. And I know LTU offers, you know, much more than, you know, car design, but, you know, architecture and urban planning and engineering and other technical aspects and all of that can play a key role in kind of what happens next as people move um, move around in the future. Um, Peter mentioned, you know, some of my background, which is both um, engineering and design, academia, living various places around the world, often leading kind of design, innovation, product development um, groups within uh, corporate environments and working with pretty much every car company at different times um, around the world. But I've uh, been focused most recently on um, three things. Operation Wheels of Freedom that, that Peter mentioned, which is a way of entertaining the military and saying thank you, but also helping um, prevent motor vehicle accidents. A company called Streetscope, which looks at the future of safety, which I'll explain. Um, and then the Futurama 2.0 initiative, which is a, a uh, proposing a new way to envision the future of how people move around and what the future of the mobile, mobility industry uh, should look like um, in the US. And, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. Um, when it comes to change, you know, designers are taught how to design for change and how to create better and new solutions um, in the future. And for me personally, um, uh, my kind of 
transformative um, moment in my life, at least when it comes to looking at the industry and the career that I was in was when I was back at Art Center after my um, product development um, leadership roles around the world, I came back to lead, um, uh, let's see, I was the vice president of educational initiatives at Art Center, looking at future opportunities for the school. And instead of just, you know, enacting a few different programs, I thought we should listen to the industry and stakeholders and very significant people that influence how everything moved around, not just cars, um, but um, the future of movement. Brought a whole array of people together. At one point, I found myself across the dinner table from the former head of the CIA, uh, Jim Woolsey, which is a, a very unusual place for a designer to be, um, but very educational and very, you know, early insight into, you know, cybersecurity and all the other things that were going to influence how we move around um, and a lot of the other um, aspects of our economy and industry and lifestyle um, that are all changing. And, and that experience um, led to the um, opportunity to testify before Congress that uh, Peter mentioned. I um, got a phone call on Thursday and by Tuesday morning, my colleague Jeff Wardle and I were testifying before Congress, um, Senator Ed Markey's um, subcommittee. And these two little designers were talking to all these congressmen about you know, what they expected from Detroit. And it wasn't just about how much money to give them. Um, our recommendation was the need for a, a long-term vision, a long-term strategy for those companies, because everybody in the room um, wanted them to survive 50 years, not, not five more months or whatever, but you know, long-term. And that's what, what we were recommending was needed um, and that they needed to provide Congress in order to receive the $35 billion or whatever the amount was at the time. And in the process, we um, had a create a written testimony. And that written testimony we later converted into a white paper, which is what you see here on the screen. Um, and it called for a new long-term vision, um, mobilizing America's transportation revolution. And it would be design-led and um, a lot like the um, original Futurama, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, that's was a very transformative moment for me ever since I've been focused on the power that design could provide in looking forward to provide change, you know, well beyond just pieces and parts of cars, but you know, the, the whole way that people move around, what motivates them and so forth. And I'll talk about all that in a minute, but that was a very important time for me and, and, and remains very influential. Um, but, but talking about change um, and, and, you know, we're, we're in, in massive change now in so many aspects of how we move around the business, you know, sharing, et cetera, is, is all things that the, the, the car industry is trying to understand, um, uh, you know, what to do about it. <laughs> it significantly changes what they do, what they provide, their revenue streams, et cetera. And so um, I will talk about that in a minute, um, but one thing I'm involved in now that is um, more near term, but still will remain very important long term. So as a startup, it's a desirable area to be looking at, into is, is safety. And as you look at new disruptive technologies that are coming like autonomous, um, uh, regardless of that technology, people want to be safe. They need to stay safe, both the people inside and obviously the environment around them as, as vehicles move. And so um, I'm working with a company called uh, Streetsco, and we're trying to kind of radically change how you objectively measure how safe vehicles move. Um, uh, today, you know, vehicles are largely measured safety-wise in um, how they can survive a crash, and from the point of crash going forward, how they manage energy and how they keep the occupants inside safe. Um, it's a very traditional method, you know, insurance companies use historical data to um, figure out what your um, risk scores are going to be and your insurance policies are going to be based on past accident data. But when new things arrive like autonomous vehicles um, that are designed to never crash or crash differently or so forth, um, you need a new system to evaluate all of that. And that's what we're creating with this uh, street scope team. Um, they're, they're basically a bunch of rocket scientists that, that um, have all worked with JPL and NASA, just finished working on all the risk mitigation for the Mars rover and so forth. So um, 
at least I have confidence that if they can figure out how to get stuff to Mars safely, we're going to figure out <clears throat> how to evaluate how safely you, you know, drive down your neighborhood street. We have a simple system that um, will look at everything in the street, street um, scape that you see out in front of you, evaluates all the hazards, can compare many different variants um, to whether the roads are slippery or whatever aspect is that is influencing how vehicles move. Um, we can calculate the actual um, hazard rates for everything on the street. And we can do that from the point of view of the car or fixed cameras. And we can evaluate it at very um, elaborate levels. Um, this may look elaborate, but I've actually had to significantly simplify what's being evaluated so I could share it in public. Um, but this system um, uh, creates a very detailed hazard score that can be used for insurance companies to price risk or for uh, fleet operators to manage, um, you know, a thousand new Waymo vehicles operating in Phoenix or whatever. Um, and, and it's it's something we're developing and something of a lot of interest from um, cities, uh, insurance companies, infrastructure and fleet fleet operators. But um, back to the future, that's, that's kind of my one near term activity that I'm doing right now. And I wanted to, to share it because fun and exciting and safety is so important, um, will remain very important. But um, the majority of what I'm gonna talk about today is, is about the future and change and, and, and everything that the industry is going through. And, and new ways that you may want to just stop, pause, and look at all this change to figure out um, what role you're going to play, um, you know, your current career, or if you're a, a student in the audience, you know, how you're going to prepare yourself to get a different type of job or to, to, to um, you know, do well in whatever industry you choose to be part of. And it may not just be going to a car company to style cars, but it could be a, a wide array of options now based on how industry is changing. You know, there's so many new things out there driving, um, you know, where money goes, how car companies are successful, what they manufacture, what services they provide. Um, you're, you're probably quite familiar with, with all of these, you know, from powertrain changes to, you know, dense urban environments that the vehicles need to, to work within, you know, the total cost of mobility, um, not just purchasing the vehicle, but the entire, you know, um, cost for its life. Obviously, ride sharing, car sharing type things. There's a whole array of additional things with, with um, you know, infrastructure requirements, artificial intelligence, you know, the tracking, managing, using data, also using data to generate revenue, you know, the cost of parking and, and old paradigms changing, like you know, just who are the big three, <laughs> or who are the big whatever now, and who is leading it, you know, is is Waymo and Apple more influential than Ford GM? And, and, and you know, who do you listen to and, and what, what drives all this change obviously are things that um, we need to understand. So I'm, I'm suggesting that we need to kind of pause and holistically look at the future of how we move around because the interdependence of the car and infrastructure is so much more intertwined than, than it used to be. When I Went through school at Art Center. We spent a lot of time designing cars and figuring out, you know, you know, with a length and height and weight and size and key functions. But it was all about the car with four wheels in the bottom and glass on top and kind of a shell. And we didn't, we didn't talk at all about the infrastructure needed, the road and, and all its interdependence and everything around it for the car to be successful and to provide value. It needs to interact with all those other things very well. And we we didn't spend any time learning about that. Um, but now it's absolutely critical. And you know, a very um, uh, well-known exercise that uh, essentially GM led <coughs> um, uh, the original Futurama. Um, and there were activities at both the 39 and 64 World's Fair. Um, they looked forward, they, they created these really cool kind of diorama physical little models that people on kind of amusement park rides would 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 run would ride through and look down into the city of the future and lifestyle changes you know living in the city and commuting out to suburb suburbs and you know all this kind of at the time future fantasy thing that um, enabled lifestyle change it, it helped accelerate you know certain specific industries obviously the car industry and other things. And it was a, 
a future vision of mobility and how it would impact lifestyle change and, and, and how it would influence um, future public policy, the 56 Highways Act and so forth, because you needed the highways to enable that and, and, and to enable that industry and enable that lifestyle change. And um, it was a very big design led Norman Bell Geddes, you know, initiative. And I'm suggesting uh, with my colleague, Jeff Wardle and others that are becoming part of the team that um, we need to do that again. The, the US needs to take on an initiative like this, bring a bunch of, you know, stakeholders together and envision the future of mobility. And I'm um, in the process of trying to pull a, a team together that would ideally, you know, help propel the, the US, um, not just the US auto industry, but the US mobility industry um, to be seen as a, a world leader like it was in the past. And I would say it's not necessarily a leader at the moment um, and, and base it on all of today's current issues, not just, you know, a, a highway without potholes or, you know, or, or, you know, a super efficient battery or something. It's the complete system that solves, you know, everybody's future mobility issues, all, you know, equitable, diverse, you know, equal access, sustainable, lower energy, better for the environment, all those kind of things all together and creating a system that would allow our um, uh, policy or government leaders to create policy that would enable all of this um, and, and do it in a way that is um, uh, good business. So it's not just a future fantasy inspired by Sid Mead and, and the latest movie techniques to be real cool looking, it, it actually makes really good business sense. And so that incentivize business and industry to want to do this, want to implement it, want to find new revenue that drives the successful implementation of this. It allows our political leaders to, to write policy and craft policy, you know, for the next 50 years, not just the next few years to get reelected, but actually a great long-term system. Wouldn't necessarily be a highway system like the last time, but would be much more reflective of what's needed in the coming um, next 50 years. So my vision, my way of looking at it, it's, it's way beyond, you know, it's not just about the car. Um, it, it's, it's about what the car enables, you know, for, for lifestyle and environmental impact and, and everything. Um, and that's what needs to be uh, looked at. So I'm, I'm now going to shift and just provide a few other topical areas and how to look at them differently um, that will help reinforce um, hopefully your ability to, to grasp this and to see how um, we should go forward a new way. Um, one is, is electric cars. And, and I'll just talk about electric cars, autonomous cars. Um, and, and how to think about it and maybe how the car industry has been um, secretly thinking about it as well. But, you know, electric vehicles, um, they're obviously here now, you know, they arrived well over a hundred years ago, um, kind of lost out to gas motors for a long time. And maybe 25 years ago, started to make a comeback with the uh, EV1 um, and various reasons it took a while till about now, but now that you've seen um, the industry is fully embracing it. You know, Ford GM and others are making big announcements. Volvo, just a couple of days ago, you have countries that are making big announcements about um, how ICE, internal West engines are no longer gonna be allowed to be sold, et cetera, all that changed. But initially when they saw them, or now they realized they can't really charge more for them. It's just an expense of transitioning um, uh, from gas engines to electrical engines, but when they went to sell them, they couldn't sell them for more. So it wasn't, it wasn't new revenue. It was, it was kind of initially seen as an expense and, and an expense that drove more cost, not an expense that drove better uh, revenue. So at first, that's why it's probably been taken so long to be adopted. And now you, now, now it's finally happening, but same with autonomous, you know, it's, it's kind of a neat technology. These cars can drive by themselves um, and, and enable some different experiences, but you know, it's, it's quite expensive to put all these sensors in the vehicle um, to test them, evaluate them um, and make sure they're safe. 
Um, and they're finding out they can't sell them for more. You know, personal individuals wanting to buy them are going to probably have to pay a, a decent premium to get one. Um, and they, they're not really easy to sell them at scale for more money. It's, it's essentially another technical expense that they have to do um, because they're kind of cornered into doing it. Um, but they can't make more money. And it's not really a, a standalone business yet. But with mobility services, it, that's now a trend that can be looked at as a, a revenue model, a business model, not just a technical expense, but a, a business model. And they can spend time to figure out just exactly how that will drive new revenue opportunities. You know, I think it's um, mobility services is what uh, really piqued the interest of companies like Apple and Waymo because they they can get involved, they can find somebody else to make the car. You know, the rumor on the street is obviously Hyundai is going to make one, and maybe FCA or um, uh, Stellantis is going to make vehicles for Waymo or whatever. But Waymo and Apple aren't going to make cars because there's not a lot of money to be made in cars. You know, it's five to eight percent or so. But services, there's a it's much wider, wide open in terms of what service can be provided. And now you've seen the the um, increase in companies like Uber and Lyft and so forth. And, and, and so that service, the ability to provide um, services and price services, not price commodities and pieces and parts and so forth, is now what's really gonna drive all this. And that is gonna enable the fact that electric cars and autonomous vehicles to take off because every um, future autonomous car is gonna be electric. And those um, future ride sharing or uh, ride sharing services um, are eventually all going to go autonomous, and they're all going to be autonomous and electric and so forth. So it's going to enable all of them together in a much better way to drive new revenue um, and completely new types of models in the future. So what's next um, when it comes to mobility? To me, it's it's all about the ability to create these new experiences that people want to be part of, that want to, people want to spend money on, that people will. Um, used to determine their satisfaction and whether they um, successfully accomplished their their ride from A to B. It won't be necessarily horsepower and the size of the trunk and other things. It, it'll be how well their experience, they judge their experience to be, um, <clears throat> will help drive how they spend money on mobility. Um, another example of change is um, I found this, and obviously it's not um, a photo I took, but you've probably seen people looking into the underneath the hood, you know, especially in the older days, and you could see the ground, which you can't see anymore. But you know, is it a V8? Is it a Hemi? Is it you know what? How you know how? What kind of noises does it make, and so forth? You know, there's a fascination with what was underneath the hood. Um, you know, there's, you know, plenty of images and old brochures of, of things like this. This is probably 10 years old or so, I think out of a Mustang. Um, and, you know, you used to be able to open the hood and be really curious what engine is inside that car. Um, but that's, that's no longer the case. I mean, if, when was the last time you ever checked underneath the hood of your taxi or Uber? Probably never, ever. And even of your newer cars, um, if you do own it, you probably look under there, see lots of plastic, but it's just not a huge part of the ownership experience, especially when you're uh, ride sharing. It's just, you know, it's just shifting. And you, you want to make sure the car gets you there. You want to make sure it's reliable, maybe quiet, but you're going to much prefer that the money that used to go into the engine or drivetrain is now going to go to the interior and the interior experience. You know, in the past, um, you know, mobility was about what gets you there, you know, the car, the brand, you know, maybe how much chrome and leather and feature and image, a lot of the brand image and all that was kind of the, the what that got you there and, and drove, you know, how you spend your money. Um, but in things like this, you probably maybe don't even know what that is. Is it a, is it a car? Is it an EV? Is it an AV? Um, who makes it, you know, what's the purpose of this little car? Can you even put two people in it? Um, this was actually a little vehicle that um, we helped define and influence from my, one of my previous startups called AIPod. 
that later Gordon Murray, um, uh, uh, Gordon Murray Design created. It's called Motive. But the whole purpose behind it was to help cities get people to their um, uh, transportation systems. You know, so this little device would get people from their house to that first last mile solution to you know a light rail, a subway, buses. This massive investment that in this case it was London had already spent on all those different types of mobility services, um, but they wanted people to use them. And so these these little devices, they would design these little autonomous mobility devices to get you to these other nice um, uh, transportation solutions. Um, and and not necessarily design this autonomous vehicle to go from London to, you know, to Rome or Italy or you know, a thousand miles away. It was meant to do a few th a few miles very well, very quickly, very reliably, out of the rain, um, <clears throat> and solve mobility problems uh, that way. But of course, you didn't own it, and other aspects were all different than today's cars. So in the future, it's going to be about how you get there um, and and how you. Um, are satisfied with your journeys. Um, and it's not necessarily how you drive, but, but how you enjoy that, that time. Um, uh, and, and solutions that um, kind of make you happy and excited and, and you know, want to spend more uh, of your money getting to wherever you're going to go in certain ways. You know, these little devices were built for, I think, Paris, or at least in France, they're built by uh, Citroën. Um, you pay for them kind of like you pay for a access to your phone and minutes and so forth and not by ownership and, and all the other hassles, just a really nice pleasurable way of getting around um, in the city. So what are all these things that are driving change? Um, uh, is it styling cost featured? All these traditional things, you know, in my view, um, it's not. It's, it's more all of these new ownership models and, and all these new things that drive revenue differently and money moving to different places and changing consumer expectations, um, as well as moving stuff. Um, moving stuff is also a very important part of all of, uh, important of, all of this. Um, I have to stop and, and say that I'm not dissing design or surface and form development. That's obviously gonna remain very important and it's gonna be a skill that many schools will still need to teach. Um, it's not just about experience. And so <clears throat> you don't have to worry about, you know, sheet metal benders taking over the world like this, this um, street cleaner, you know, really cool street cleaners are going to be um, desirable as well. You're still going to uh, have an appreciation for design and the traditional form development process. Um, real quickly with autonomous and then, and then I'll, I'll finish. But, um, you know, so in the autonomous world, you have, you know, traditional players, even you could say Waymo is now in a, a traditional player and obviously things like Cruise um, and, and their connection to, to GM. But there's so many new players entering the market that are going to cause disruption and change. Um, <clears throat> in the U.S. probably don't talk a lot, but, but Baidu, leading Chinese um, uh, provider that really wants to get into that space. You have the, the big data companies and, and electronics companies like, you know, Apple, you have service providers like Uber, and then you have people like Canoe who are developing and offering complete new kind of business models and usage models as they deliver uh, design new vehicles. Um, but but to just simplify all this, it, to me, it's all about um, uh, capturing revenue spent on mobility. That's what's going to drive the adoption of autonomous, uh, the adoption of these new technologies, and they're, you know, companies like Apple and, and Waymo, they want, you know, 50% margins and they're going to make 50% margins like they do on their phones by providing service and they'll find somebody else to manufacture to make the five to 8% on the manufacturing side and have to deal with all the capital investment and the large scale manufacturing and so forth. And they'll focus on providing the service and managing all the data that goes along with it. And that's going to drive significant change and it's going to drive kind of who are the big players um, in the room and who's going to make the decision. And, and it could be at some point, um, you know, Apple and Waymo and, and a few others are now the OEMs. And then unfortunately, the traditional companies like Ford, GM, Stellantis, et cetera, um, are going to be tier two suppliers of hardware. Um, they're going to try very hard not to. So maybe, maybe it'll go well that they don't 
end up that way, but um, I'm quite sure that Apple and Waymo are not going to all of a sudden manufacture hardware. So somebody will have to do that. And somebody else will drive a lot of the change. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, just if you can have an experience in the car where you're not driving stressed out um, uh, and, and uh, worried about staying safe and you can think about doing other things, whether it's work, whether it's relaxing, whether it's getting ready for your destination, um, that's going to drive the adoption of things like autonomous and it's going to allow you to spend money in new ways um, on your mobility. Um, and it's, it goes without saying, but I've talked a lot about autonomous influencing how people move around, but how stuff moves around um, is also very important. And autonomous will, will play a big role in, in, in all these other aspects, not just for moving uh, people. They already are, like John Deere and others have been using autonomous um, on farming equipment for, I don't know, 10, 15 years already. So, um, or small delivery of goods and things. Um, you can see a lot more adoption and technology advancement in that. So I don't know who's all out there watching or listening, but if you are in a career and you feel like this guy, where you are um, uh, detailing a product that has very limited influence on the future um, and you are trying to do a really good job, but you know maybe in the future, um, we don't even need white lines on the road anymore. So you could be really good at being a white line painter and it's not even something that's needed in the future. You know, So if you're working, you know, sweating the details on a road to nowhere, um, you might wanna start asking um, different questions about the future and how you can influence it, um, what you need when it, if it, when it comes to mobility for yourself, for your business, for, um, for whatever your contribution is. And so I'm, I'm going to finish with um, what I refer to as um, Dave's top five things to think about. Um, it's kind of uh, just another way of looking at the future and what's influencing it. And then you can, you know, take it into yourself and figure out how it influences what you do specific within your, your life and your space. But the first one to me is, is time. Um, you know, no matter, you know, who you are, whether you are uh, Donald Trump or, or Biden or any leader in any country or um, uh, from, from any ethnic race or any region or any level of economic income, everybody on the planet has 24 hours a day. That's it. There's, there's nothing you can do about that, no matter who you pay off or, or how you vote or whatever, you have 24 hours a day. And how you spend that, you know, determines how much satisfaction you have in, in, in your life and your happiness and your, your sense of success every day is in that 24 hours. And if somebody can develop a mobility device that gives you a much more satisfactory, low stress, efficient, effective use of an hour, hour and a half every day, um, people are gonna spend money for that, uh, spend money on that. And if it comes via autonomous, or a ride sharing service or whatever, and your commute every day, your mobility every day is better than it used to be, people are gonna be willing to spend money on that. And I think that's a huge aspect of changing your mobility preferences and your methods is how effective and positive or better you know, your time uh, is spent. The next is just perception of how you look at it. You know, People think of driving as you know, a fun, sunny countryside drive in a Corvette or a convertible, and they're just enjoying where they're going. They're not in a hurry. They're just having fun. Well, you know that that's good, but you know that's one percent of the time, and eighty percent of the time is like this, stuck in traffic and scenes like this, or maybe scenes like this plus five hundred potholes. Um, that's probably what people do much more often, and so it makes a lot of sense that vehicles are going to be designed not just for the upper left, but, you know, for commuting and effectively getting from here to here, here to there, no matter what the uh, outside environment is like um, or traffic or three miles an hour or whatever. Um, it, it makes sense that vehicles are going to um, solve these two things differently. And the, the perceived thought of the upper left Corvette ride is, um, 
uh, not really happening that often. And, and you need to start designing for what actually happens on a daily basis. Mobility experiences for sure, you know, just a simple example of, you know, in the past, all the money in the interior of the car was focused on the driver, the front left corner, all the features were accessible up there and that would kind of drive how satisfied people were when they bought the car. But in the future, a lot more money is going to be spent or might be spent in the rear seat through all of the, the passengers that get in and out through ride sharing services. They're in the back seat. So you're going to see a lot more uh, interior content and, and spending on the rear versus the front and shifting the space allocation and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you're going to see that shift. You're also going to see satisfaction like JD Powers is going to start publishing consumer satisfaction based on every 20 minute journey. So not five years of ownership or two years of ownership or initial ownership. It's going to be on these little journeys and how satisfied you were with those. Um, and those mobility experiences are going to drive how you spend your money. Another important thing to look at, the fourth one is the stakeholders. You know, in the past, it was the owner of the car, the guy who bought the car, the person who bought the car, and the car maker. You know, that was the, kind of the big dynamic. But now, especially with ride sharing services, you still have the car maker. Somebody still makes the car. But now you have a driver. Um, and the driver may have purchased the car, but now you have all these passengers and the passengers are the one that are putting new money into the system every time they ride, the, they ride in the back seat. And then you have an operator and the operator might be, um, you know, become very influential, you know, like Uber Lyft might be buying hundreds of thousands of cars. And so they could become very influential, but then the driver works for them kind of, and then where's the passenger. So it's hard to understand, well, who is the consumer in all of this? Um, anyway, it's quite obvious that the, that stakeholder model is changing significantly and who drives the design of the car and what's in the car and how the money gets spent and where the money goes, all is going to drive change. And then you have this, um, all these stakeholders that influence not just like what I said in, in ride sharing services, but you know, in delivery services and urban planners and city planners, insurance companies, investment you know, new revenue generating entities, cybersecurity issues. You have the, the new manufacturer people like Canoe and you have the traditional car manufacturers like many of those in Detroit. All of those wanting to influence how all this comes together and, and, and how we, uh, regulation is created and so on and so forth. Um, keeping all of that in mind as you try to develop a new business and a new mobility model is all um, obviously very important. And then, of course, um, uh, business 101 is just, you know, follow the money. Where's the new revenue going to go? Um, and, and how are they going to influence change and expectations and so forth? Um, following, you know, future revenue streams, creating new future revenue streams is obviously something to very much <clears throat> follow and watch. So what does all this, what does all this mean? In all this change, there's, as I mentioned through all, all this discussion, there's there's lots happening. And it's not just like in the old, I shouldn't say the old days, but when I was in the middle of new car design stuff, it was, you know, making everything lighter um, and, and lower cost materials or what's, what's something to replace leather or, you know, a lot of these traditional things that you know, everybody familiar with the car industry is familiar with, but those all still need to happen. Um, but so much more is influencing what the vehicle needs to be and what the mobility journey needs to be and how consumers are, are kept happy is, is so much more dynamic than just the materials of, of how you manufacture a car and stamp a sheet metal body or whatever. Now maybe, you know, uh, new battery technology and thing, but it's just so much more um, diverse and, and uh, um, harder to understand, and thus why I think we need a new vision going forward. You know, I mentioned these five things, time, you know, driving versus commuting, um, experiences, stakeholders, and following where the money's going to go, because it's, it's not going to the same people anymore. So there's going to be a lot more newer um, influences. And so I, I very strongly think we need, uh, um, we need to think differently about, you um, the future and, and a new way of creating um, the future. And one last story, and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, 
uh, let myself um, answer questions um, that uh, um, Peter has um, been collecting. Um, so one little experience that that also helped influence how I think about what's important when thinking about the future, especially as a designer, was when I was out at Art Center. Um, a friend of mine called. His name is uh, Frank Stevenson. He was the chief designer for McLaren, and a fellow student from school. And he said, "Hey, I want to launch my new McLaren at Art Center, um, or basically in North America. Could we do it at Art Center? Um, and you know, it's a great background and stuff." So I said, <laughs> "Sure, why? Yes, yeah, we can do that." So as, as arrangements were being made. I thought, what a, what a great way to influence my son, who was probably, oh, somewhere six, seven, eight, something like that at the time. And I said, what, to influence about what I do and car design and the coolness of cars and all that kind of stuff, meet some important people, hopefully get influenced and, and want to do what I do, kind of. I'm sure many parents in the audience have done similar things. So we go to the event. It's finally put together. We're there. You know, there's a lot of press and media is a big deal having a new McLaren come out and 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 uh, like so Oliver was there with me. We got to meet like Jay Leno and some of the other celebrities and stuff and Frank and we we're up front and they were like a similar car reveal. You know, everybody's around the media ready. They pull the cover off of the car, the the flashes go off and I'm all excited because I'm you know it's a really cool new McLaren. I think the MPT MP12 4C or something like that was the model. And then I'm like, oh, I wonder what Oliver's thinking about it, you know. And then I look down, and he's not even paying attention. <laughs> he's he's on his phone, the the new symbol of success. Um, he's worried about you know his high score in Angry Birds. He's not really into what I liked. And to me, it was a big reminder that I need to be thinking about what these people want in the future, not what I necessarily want in the future. And designing not just cooler cars, um, because that can be done by people, but you know, bigger future mobility solutions that are going to motivate people like my son and, and, and future generations of that age. Um, anyway, I just want to share that because in 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 that experience, I now realize there's kind of a different focus for how I think about the future um, and why I think. On a country level, we need something new, um, uh, like the original Futurama, um, updated and adjusted for all today's issues and concerns and so forth. And um, why I'm very passionately focused on that right now. So uh, with that, I thank you for the opportunity of sharing thoughts about the future and what designers can do to influence it and, and how I believe the automotive and mobility um, industry is gonna change and what, what big role design can play in all of that. So, thank you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, that was very inspirational and that's a great story about your son. Um, and that's a great parting, uh, parting thought that you have there. I'm going to start off the questions, and I'm going to encourage everybody to to speak up when when uh, when there's a gap, uh, or write your questions uh, into the chat on uh, Zoom or on YouTube, and I will parlay those to to David. My first question, David, is the fact that not too long ago uh, we were kind of lamenting the fact that the world had passed us by with um, high speed trains and that uh, we had kind of missed the boat in the US, but I'm thinking that now that, you know, we have so much technological evolution and change with autonomy and, and electric uh, power that um, we perhaps don't have to build those huge infrastructure systems of high-speed trains that we could probably, you know, use our highways um, and just use them uh, with, with autonomous or semi-autonomous stuff that can go faster and can go more safely. Uh, how do you view high-speed trains in that light now? Um, well, all, all these different forms of, of transportation all kind of play different roles, have different impacts on, on the environment and the existing infrastructure and so forth. I, I do think high-speed rail um, can still play a role um, if you follow what's happening in 
in China, obviously what already exists in, in, in Europe, um, but China's going, going nuts, um, <laughs> building high-speed rail like crazy, um, um, partially because the government can mandate it, partially because they um, have just made a national commitment to help move their people around in better, more efficient ways. But also it's a great alternative to um, <clears throat> uh, short distance flight because of the emissions and, and carbon released from, from flight. They're, they're a great al alternative to that. Um, they don't solve you know, short term, uh, short distance issues um, perfectly, but um, it's, it's unfortunate that the US is so far behind. Um, and, and how much political fighting happens just to get one rail from one, you know, just from San Francisco to LA, you know, it's um, unfortunate that it's, and even with what's being fought over to get that to happen, it's not even state of the art. It's not even the fastest or the second fastest or the third fastest. Um, it's, you know, so that's, that's very unfortunate. What, what is similar in high-speed rail spaces is something like Hyperloop. And um, there's a number of companies. Um, I, I've been working with the one connected to, um, to, to Europe, um, but there's, there's a lot of advantages to, to building a Hyperloop system um, that can provide much faster regional transport, um, even faster than, than high-speed rail. Um, that should also be considered and looked at. So if you're not familiar with those technologies, there's a lot of benefit to both the movement of people as well as the movement of goods that um, things like Hyperloop can, can provide. Great. Yeah, we're familiar with that. It's, uh, we have such a tremendous interstate system um, that uh, it, it just seems more likely that we could um, enlarge or, or amplify that system to, to take uh, high-speed uh, technology instead of cutting through people's properties and, and uh, you know, cutting off wildlife's, you know, migration patterns and so forth by these defenses that they create. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, I, I ask anybody else who's got a question to, to speak up. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. So my question is in regards to uh, brand prestige in the autonomous era. Now, uh, where I live is Texas, and it's very simple. When you have more money, you just buy a bigger truck. And up here, what I'm noticing is when you have more money, you switch from Chevy to Buick, or you switch from Buick to Cadillac. So when there's this one company that comes out with the perfect autonomous car, it's the cheapest to build, cheapest to buy, saves you the most time, wouldn't they just annihilate the rest of the market? Like, where does Mercedes or Audi come in in that respect? Um, well, I, uh, uh, well, obviously if somebody <clears throat> comes along with a awesome technical solution, um, and a ability to deliver that, you know, the service or the complete ownership experience or whatever in a great way, and it's half the price of everything else, then, <laughs> then that could be an issue. Um, I don't think it's going to happen that way. Um, the amount of technology that's required to do autonomous right and safe and reliable uh, means that just anybody can't do it. There's been a lot of startups that try to do it, but you know, they pretty much have all failed. Um, and so you need, you know, billions of dollars to, to, to get there. Um, so I, I don't know that that's, um, that's going to happen. What I, what I could see, and I'll, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but what I think it would be an awesome challenge is you, you, you just, listed a bunch of brands that all came from the, you know, manufacturing car world and you want to build a brand and there's brand equity in that round thing on your hood, whether it's BMW or Corvette or whatever. Um, but it's typically about owning that brand. I think there's a huge opportunity that if you can build brand loyalty and excitement around a service. So let's say BMW brand you wanted to be associated with the service of mobility that BMW offers. And you figure out how to make that exciting and desirable and cool and the way of showing it. Cause a lot of times brand is about showing off to your friends or showing off to somebody else, not just yourself. 
But if you could show off that you're part, I'm just using BMW as an example, but if, if you had the BMW mobility experience connected to you in the same way you have as on your keychain to drive a BMW, um, that would really drive change towards, you know, shared ownership models and service models and so forth. I think that's what is a bigger change than just figuring out a cheaper autonomous technology platform. Hey, David, and you can see this is already happening. So Audi uh, has a silver car model. So yep. you, own a, you own an Audi, you're part of the ecosystem, you get on a flight, you fly somewhere else, you show up and an Audi pulls up to then drive you to where you need to be because you're part of the ecosystem of Audi. They yep. are doing it, but there's no consistency in service delivery, right? And so what you're talking about uh, in an American model which I really appreciate is in conflict with the political structure of the country. Um, it's not a question. It's a statement. I mean, what, and I, I love this because I hear this stuff all the time, but what designers want to do and how the political structure of the country operates are two different things. How do you resolve that? <laughs> Uh, well, it, okay. sorry, stupid question. I know it's a stupid uh, question. It's, okay, it, it's a, it's a. In today's world, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, I would say if you don't do anything, you'll definitely not have change. So, you have to think about how to approach it. And well, for, like with the silver car thing, you know, I see silver car as purely as an experiment by Audi. I can almost yep. guarantee they lose a lot of money with that. But the, they're going to use it. They're going to lose a ton of money, but they're going to make a ton of money on selling more cars. Um, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I know, like you know, the BMW version, the BMW Drive now, uh, Drive you know, those type of things. They were all just learning experiences, but they they didn't right. make money. But anyway, on the political side, if you're referring to the the Futurama thing um, and how you get. Um, I could talk a long time, but I have a whole strategy about how to get to, to Pete, Pete Buttigieg, Secretary of Transportation, and how to pitch this in a way that it actually helps. It, it would it, it it's it would work across the aisle. It's not meant to be red or blue. It's not meant to be catered. Oh, only do it because the blue's in charge now or something. It would be a win-win no matter who is in in uh, political power because it enables um, economic growth, enables jobs, yeah. it enables. A lot of things to happen if you can bring all the key stakeholders together and envision a future system that works for far more people than say just one guy with deep pockets who knows how to bore holes in the ground and go to space and build electric cars and you guys know what i'm talking about yep. you know that one guy is making change happen but he's just one guy and he's not creating systems for everybody to be successful it's, it's enabling his space which is good that's how the us works um, but if you have a broader vision, when transportation requires a, a good partnership with infrastructure, like you obviously see with electric vehicles needing charging and, 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 and infrastructure dependence and slowing EVs and so forth, um, I think a broad vision partnership that is designed like the first one in 39 World's Fair, uh, GM1, but with today's issues, it could only bring a better future than just doing nothing. I'm happy to talk all night on it. Yeah, we, uh, we, we yeah. probably could run for the next four or five hours on this and I'd be happy to do it. So oh, that's very interesting. I don't see any YouTube questions. Liz, Liz had a question on the chat, Peter. Okay. All right. There is one YouTube question as well. So we'll get to that. Um, this is from Liz. Dave, do you have confidence with the new administration that our country will start to finally initiate the infrastructure needed to support this new mobility future. Can you elaborate on your initiative? Um, you already started that. <laughs> yeah, well, I have confidence it's worth doing. I'm motivated and every conversation I've had so far with various companies have all been uh, very positive, follow-up meetings, they wanna talk about more and none of them have said, go away, it'll never happen. So I've been encouraged um, by that. In terms of getting to, to Pete, um, one nice thing about Pete, because I, I know the two or three other guys that were um, in the running for it, um, Pete is um, new to transportation. 
He's phenomenally smart. And, um, but the fact that he's new means he doesn't have a whole series of biases about, oh, well, you know, we have to keep all these existing transportation funded things going just because that's what I've always done. He, everything is new and fresh and he seems fairly independent and he's, I would say, well above average intelligence. So I think it's possible. And I think in the model that we're trying to create, it's, it'll excite and motivate consumers to want to be part of it. Um, and when, when poet, pol not pol policy and, and our political leaders see that their consumers, no matter what state they're from, are going to want improvement, um, they're going to be more supportive because it, their, their voters are going to like it more. And we're going to build it in a way that is good for business. It's not just going to be Star Wars fantasy stuff. It'll be um, well thought out, um, 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 good business so that it actually gets implemented and it doesn't let the various companies not invest because they know it's going to change. It's, it's going to be an exciting long-term vision. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm confident. I know um, I did this once with a guy by the name of Jim Overstar. I ran the transportation committee 15 years ago. He's from Minnesota, um, which is where I'm from. So I got close to um, trying to make this happen. And I'm hoping to find enough corporate support and funding in the next infrastructure bill that some money could be set aside to uh, create this vision. And it won't be just money for me. We'll find a very diverse group of corporate stakeholders that, that want to make this happen, kind of like what GM did. But I think this time around, you, you couldn't have just one company. So we need multiple companies. And there's new technologies. It's not just about cars. It's much more diverse. Um, so anyway, I, I'm positive. I know uh, the political world is very complicated these days. So I know there's pitfalls that I um, don't yet know, but I'm willing to keep going. That's great. So we have another question from YouTube from Jisoo. Um, <clears throat> the question is, if these trends manifest, what's the future for those who live in low density situations? So a good point, um, because um, there's not necessarily lots of money in the low dense uh, parts of the country, but there are still plenty of voters and any political support for something like this is going to need um, solutions that work, um, you know, dense urban environments, big cities, as well as um, uh, out across the plains in less dense urban environments. There is still a lot of movement of goods. Um, I've already started a conversation with the uh, Utah Inland Port Authority. Um, and you guys are probably thinking, well, like, well, what kind of port is in the middle of Utah? Well, a huge percentage of the US GDP goes through Utah in the form of trucks and rail. Um, because it comes from San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, and um, LA. Um, and so that's a huge economic um, influencer, even though it's in, in the middle of nowhere. So, but, so long story short, whatever visionary solutions come out, uh, come out of all of this um, will require positive solutions that support, um, let's say rural areas or less dense areas um, that also advance um, uh, allow advancement for them over the next 50 years as well. Fantastic. Okay. <clears throat> Can I uh, ask for more questions? Any of the transportation design students curious about what the future holds? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned like that you think the future is going to be more controlled by like these newer um, companies like Google and Apple and their service aspect of it. Do you think that like the more traditional OEMs can still get in on that? Um, or do you think they're far enough behind that they might just be stuck following with the, just the hardware role? Um, I think they've smartly um, uh, made the commitment to, to change. I think they, they have the disadvantage of they um, have massive existing infrastructure, uh, capital investment, manufacturing plants, injection molding machines that they, you know, and then obviously lots of employ existing employees that they got to somehow uh, keep happy and look after. And, and the other guys, um, they can 
you know, I'll just use Apple Waymo as, as, as easiest to understand example. They can come into this new business. They don't have to build a capital intensive manufacturing plant in Ohio or on the East Coast or something. They can just start focused on data and the service and managing how people spend money like they are doing with um, autonomous. You know, they're, they're curating how autonomous comes together. They're, they're making sure that that one new technology works great but they're not redesigning tires or windshields or the rest of the car, which somebody has to do safely, um, but they're just doing the part that has to work right, the safety critical autonomous type stuff. And then while they're doing that, I'm sure they're building business models that will enable them to capture revenue in the forms of, of service. So, but all that being said, and why I think I still have friends within the car industry, you know, uh, a story actually that, um, uh, came out of when I spoke at the Auto Week Design Forum in Detroit several years ago. Um, I presented something along these lines um, many years ago, and the editor of Auto Week, a guy by the name of Dutch Mandel, said at the end, he goes, you know, Dave, um, I don't know whether to slip my wrist or jump out the window after hearing all that, <laughs> hearing all that, and how I was talking about the industry. And, um, but he still likes me. <laughs> and <laughs> The, the reason I think that the car industry, where I don't really want to talk bad about the car industry or say that they're screwed, there's no future, they have the advantage of, they're the only ones that really know how to design a box that moves people safely at high speeds. You know, Apple doesn't do that. They build a lot of other products really well, but they don't have a product where people get inside and drive 100 miles an hour and you feel safe. And that's definitely one advantage that I think all the car companies have is that they know how to do that. And so as they're, and you can't do that um, and still design an autonomous, autonomous car, the, the shell, the core, the traditional part of the vehicle needs to be safe. And the car companies know how to do that. They have the engineers and the technology and the history and so forth to do that. And that has to be done well. So I think if they uh, continue to do that well and leverage the aspect that these other guys don't know how to do, um, then they have a chance um, uh, to protect a certain amount of the business for themselves in the future. I have a question. Okay, Liz. I, Dave, do you think that companies like General Motors, Ford and Stellantis might actually be acquired by Apple or Google or uh, Amazon? Um, I think it's certainly possible. Um, I'm sure pride and history and so forth that will, will add to the economic decision and they will probably try not to be, but um, uh, those guys have a lot of cash sitting around um, and uh, that might, you know, they, they may have an arrangement similar to what, what um, you know, Apple does with how they manufacture their phones, you know, Apple, um, defines every aspect of that piece of hardware and every aspect of that service and experience, but they let somebody else manufacture it. And I don't know whether Apple, what percentage of ownership they have in Foxconn or, or whatever, but um, there could be relations similar to that that are still win-win for both sides. But, you know, clearly Apple dictates that partnership um, but still Foxconn uh, must be making money and, and so forth. So, um, so yes, I think it could happen. I think maybe Ford and GM, maybe not, maybe Stellantis, you know, because they've had so many different uh, from, from the Germans and the Italians and now the French and all their various partnerships. They, they've worked it really well. They, uh, from what I can tell, they have really happy people inside. Um, but maybe there's a, another financial move that happens that, that somebody else then gobbles them up. I'm not sure. Dave, I have a question. Yep. yep. Um, to what extent do we expect people to let their market preferences be driven by climate change or environmental issues? I didn't see that come up so much as um, you know a market factor, but I'm trying to have hope that our younger generations will um, will are interested in taking that into account. Um, I've I yeah I did talk about a lot today, I have been more involved in kind of sustainable mobility discussions and solutions. And I think from an industry standpoint, they've struggled because when they've tried to provide 
let's say more environmentally friendly solutions, whether it's emissions or material choices and so forth, they've had a hard time finding and getting consumers to pay more for it. And they so often then they're not going to pay more for it. <laughs> We're not going to provide it. It's just, it's too hard to do. But I think, you know, just the shift to electric is going to be um, very helpful. I think the, the move to shared business models where, you know, one vehicle can service people for 18 hours instead of, you know, service people for an hour and a half and then go in a garage that there will be some in, inherent benefits on both space and the environment and emissions through the shift to electric. And then the ability in the future to, to, cat, to obviously generate the power through sustainable methods more and to um, uh, control any emissions that are created while generating electricity if it's not through renewables. Um, so it's, I think it's probably something more that the industry and public policy needs to drive, but I think it, it is now going to, as you see all these countries that are just blocking ICE cars in the future, that it will move to better ways. It probably won't be by massive consumer and younger consumers buying preferences changing as much as the joint infrastructure change and public policy change and so forth. Right, I do think that's a policy area. You know, some of the things that you talked about are a lot of, I think a, a lot of times policymakers will follow the market, but I feel like with respect to climate change, it's one area where, you know, leaders could, could look at um, with more diligence, but that's just me. Uh, a really good friend of mine just became the, um, he just started working for the Biden administration. He, he works with DOE, his name is Jigger Shaw. Um, and he's now responsible for all the money they give out through loans um, on new energy. And um, if there's one ray of hope from today, it was hearing that he was just chosen to take that role. He, he was the um, founder of Sun Edison, uh, ran the Carbon War Room, and he's probably the smartest guy I know when it comes to new energy solutions. Anyway, off topic, but FYI. I've got an interesting um, comment to make, I think, because I run a design class that is, is looking at designing services that um, come to people's houses and businesses rather than uh, you having to go to them. And the whole COVID um, lockdown has forced uh, people to rethink where they go and who they talk to and how often they, uh, wherever they go for, for services. And so this project is, is kind of on the back of that idea that there, there could be new business solutions and service solutions that uh, actually bring a service to, to you rather than uh, you going to them. And um, so that's, we're learning very, very quickly that uh, um, you have to think of the service provider and the end user like you talked about as well in these new service, uh, these new um, uh, service industries. And so I think there's, there's going to be um, an opening up of business opportunities. And um, I think the vehicles that are produced will, will, will maybe not be so personalized, uh, but uh, I think that there'll still be quite a, quite a number of different vehicles. Um, I also think that, you know, as you said, if, if, you're, if you only use a car an hour and a half a day and it's parked, and if there's 17 million new cars sold in the US every year, that's on a good year, um, that uh, if cars change from being used only an hour and a half a day to 18 hours a day or more, um, there are gonna be a lot fewer cars made because they'll be more useful. So I think that the numbers of, of those vehicles will go down. What do you um, think? Well, if it depends on how you, you track it all, but if you look at vehicle miles traveled, I think people are still gonna move around and that's gonna require, you know, so cars may not, um, uh, What's the easiest way to explain it? But it, it, I don't see that the car companies are going to go out of business because people don't buy cars or you're going to go from 17 to 5 million. Um, you're going to need 
new methods of looking at vehicles so that a vehicle may um, uh, last longer because it's, it's in these more controlled use cycles, but you'll need to design the interior to be refreshed um, just like a hotel gets refreshed, you know, every day, you know, every week, every year, every five years, it gets completely redone. You know, every 30 years, the whole shell is, you'll need to design a car in a similar way. So it always seems new and fresh for each user. Um, well, that, the ability to do that, you know, it's a new business, a new industry, you know, interior manufacturers are going to make interiors in different ways and new ways of putting them in and out, new services, new cleaning services. So, that's why I think looking at the entire ecosystem of mobility industry, there's a lot more new business and new revenue that can be generated, not necessarily just by manufacturing a car, putting it out on the street corner, selling it for five years, and then building another one. You know, the model's going to change, but people still need to move around. Goods still need to move around. So there's still money to be made. It's just capturing it in new and different ways. That's a great way to sum it up, David. Are there any other questions? I think we've reached the end of our time and um, I would like to, on behalf of the lectures and exhibitions committee at Lawrence Technological University, I'd like to thank you very much for imparting your, um, your, your views on, on us and your, on your vision. And um, I, I hope to see you again at, um, in another venue uh, similar to this. Thank you, David. Yep, sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you.